20 years ago, when Ford launched the first Expedition, they sold 200,000 of them in the first year. But for 2018, the Expedition is entering a very different full-size SUV market. Although SUV sales have been fairly strong the last few years, all of the full-size body-on-frame SUVs put together are expected to be around 350,000 units in 2018. The main reason for that, of course, is the explosion in crossover sales, like Ford's very own Explorer crossover. One of the big reasons that you might want to buy an Expedition over an Explorer, however, is the towing and the payload capacity, because this is a truck-based SUV. So under the body, this is more closely related to the F-150 than, for instance, a Ford Fusion. As you'd expect from a modern full-sized SUV, the front end of the Expedition is big and bold, as are these headlamp modules. They're really quite large. These are the optional full LED headlamp modules. Halogen beams are standard in base models, but the turn signal, as you can see on that side of the vehicle, remains a halogen lamp in all models. It actually occupies sort of the center section of the C-shaped headlamp modules. We also have an LED light pipe in there that gives us a distinctive look at night. At the bottom of the bumper, we find fog lamps down there and chrome tow hooks in the four-wheel drive models, well-integrated front parking sensors, and as you can see, a great deal of cooling up front because obviously this vehicle was designed with towing in mind. Dimensions can be difficult to discern in video, but standing next to the Expedition, I can very easily rest my arm on the hood because this is quite high off the ground overall. It also is notably wider than the average three-row crossover in America. So just how big is the Expedition? Well, it starts at 210 inches long for the short version. That's about six inches longer than a Chevy Tahoe. We're taking a look at the Max version, which is 221 inches long. Interestingly enough, that makes this actually about three inches shorter than a Chevy Suburban, although this seems to be a little bit more efficiently packaged than the Suburban. One of the novel things about the Expedition's overall design is that it actually has an independent rear suspension, and Ford has packaged it kind of interestingly with the half shafts actually going through the frame of the vehicle. That helps things be a little bit more compact in the rear, gives us more cargo room in the back, and a little bit more practicality versus something like a Tahoe or a Suburban. The independent rear suspension helps improve the ride and handling dynamics of the Expedition, but it doesn't have any effect on the towing capacity. Towing capacity still comes in at 9,000 pounds for the Max version, 9,300 pounds for the shorter Expedition. Rear end styling in the Expedition is very upright and very square that helps improve cargo practicality. And there's another nice touch back here that I really appreciate is a separately opening rear glass. This is something that we aren't really seeing in very many vehicles these days because it costs a little bit extra to make rather than a tailgate or a lift gate rather that opens like this. The design of the rear tail lamp modules mimics the headlamp design. You can see right there that we have LEDs for that turn signal module because of course it is just blinking the brake light. Following the trend set by Ford's latest F-150, we don't find a V8 engine powering this 5,700-pound SUV. Instead, we have a 3.5-liter V6 with two turbochargers. Thanks to those twin turbochargers, power comes in at a healthy 375 horsepower, and torque comes in at a massive 470 foot-pounds. That's a diesel-like power number. Then we have the Platinum version, which is what we're looking at right here, that produces 400 horsepower, and the torque bumps up to 480 pound-feet. As with most body-on-frame SUVs, this vehicle sends its power to the rear wheels by default, although you do have the option of two different four-wheel drive systems. Sending the power from the engine to the axles is an all-new 10-speed automatic transmission. According to the EPA, fuel economy ranges between 20 miles per gallon for the rear-wheel drive model, 18 miles per gallon for the least efficient four-wheel drive trim. I give Front Seat Comfort 10 out of 10 points, even when compared to full-size luxury entries like the Cadillac Escalade. These are very, very comfortable seats. They're also quite adjustable. We have four-way adjustable lumbar support and an available anti-fatigue massage function. The massage functionality is not quite as aggressive as we see in the latest Lexus models, but the seat design itself is kind of interesting because we have three different air bladders back there for the lumbar support, and they're independently adjustable via this touchscreen infotainment system. That's not something we see in most vehicles out there. We also have an electric tilt telescopic steering column and adjustable pedals in the model that we're driving. As you'd expect from a large vehicle like this, rear seat comfort is excellent. Sitting right here behind a six foot five passenger that I had in the vehicle, I still have several inches of legroom left. Now, this second row seat slides forward and backward to help apportion the space more equitably between the front, second, and third rows. Scooting over to the other side, this front seat's adjusted for me at six feet tall, and now I have about six or seven inches of legroom left. 
The Expedition is available as either a seven passenger or an eight passenger SUV. We're driving the seven passenger model, which means that we don't have a center seat right here. Instead, we get these two captain's chairs with large armrests that fold down and a pathway to make it a little bit easier to get into the third row. Of course, you can still tilt and slide the second row seats forward in order to get into the third row. And it's worth knowing that you can do that with a child seat latched into place using the latch anchors and top tether anchor. Making this even more practical, both of these second row seats move in exactly the same way. So you actually could have two child seats latched into place and still get into the third row from either side. With the second row slid all the way back, I still have about an inch of legroom left. And you'll notice the key difference from this camera angle between this and the Explorer. These seats are higher off of the ground. It's also true when you compare this to the average three row crossover. Even though we don't have more headroom, which is measured between the actual ceiling of this vehicle where my hair is brushing, and of course this seat bottom cushion, than the Explorer, we actually have a more comfortable seat. Space efficiency may be higher in the average three row crossover, but actual cargo space certainly isn't. Behind this hatch, we find 20.9 cubic feet if you get the short wheelbase expedition. If you get the model that we're looking at here that expands to 36 cubic feet. The average three row crossover in America has just over 10 cubic feet of storage space behind the third row seats. And even something like the Ford Explorer, which is definitely on the large side for a three row crossover, has 19.3. Taking a closer look at the cargo area, we have two pop-up sections in the load floor. This front section opens like that, and then also double hinges like this, although I'm not entirely clear why you would want to do that. You can sort of drop it into place right like that, and I guess have things propped up against it. First, I didn't find that mode too handy. And then we have this back section, which has another deep storage well there. That's particularly handy if you're putting small items in the back of this vehicle, and you don't want them to roll around the back. There are also some grocery bag holders that pop out of each side, and we have power folding third row seats. We just press that button right there. It's a single one press operation. You can either fold them both at the same time or fold them individually. And then we have power releases for the second row seats. This will drop them, but it won't cause them to fold back up. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in the top end model, and that's why we find this large panoramic moonroof. Obviously, since this is a very large vehicle, a moonroof that would be big on another car just extends to over the second row for this vehicle and not quite to the second row passengers' heads. The driver and front passenger get two-way adjustable headrests and height adjustable seat belts. The front door panels feature a stitched upper section and a stitched insert right there above that large armrest. We find basically the same controls that we see in other Ford models, although they're positioned a little bit differently to go with the general styling of this door. The door handle itself is a little bit difficult to see from this angle, but it's basically the same door handle that we see in Ford's pickup trucks. So you just reach there inside that crevice and pull the handle towards you to open the door. We then have large bottle holders right there at the bottom of the door, right next to that large speaker grill. As you'd expect from an SUV that's related to Ford's pickup truck line, the interior is styled very much like the Ford pickup trucks as well. We have a lot of soft touch plastics going on on the upper section of the dashboard and hard plastics lower. On the passenger side, we have a dual glove box arrangement. We have this upper glove box, which has a slot there big enough for large tablet style smartphones. And then we have a bin style glove compartment below that where you could easily put things like a small iPad, although I was not able to fit a larger tablet computer inside. A nice touch with this glove box is that we have a separate slot for the instruction manual that makes it a little bit easier to find. Moving over to the center of the dashboard, we have a storage tray right there at the top of the center stack, and you can just see the Bang & Olufsen logo there on the optional sound system center channel speaker. Moving down from there, we have hill descent control, the button for trash control disable, hazard light buttons, lane keeping assistance, the auto start stop system that is standard on all models of the Expedition, and a button to engage and disengage the 360 degree camera system. The front camera is placed just below that large Ford logo. You can see that we're facing forward right now with that system. If I move the vehicle into reverse, then we see backup lines that are active and do move with the steering wheel you can see right there. Since the Expedition is a new product, it also uses the latest version of Ford Sync, which supports Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. We also have built-in factory navigation. Although in an interesting touch, if you hit the navigation button right there in that screen, it actually takes you back to CarPlay because it knows that it's connected. Below the infotainment screen on the far left, we find the engine start stop button, then trailer controls. This is the trailer backup control. This is kind of an interesting Ford feature to help you back up a trailer. Although personally, I found it a little bit easier just to back up a trailer the traditional way. Below that, we have an integrated trailer brake controller right there, gain adjustments with this up and down button. Then we have some physical controls for the infotainment system. There's a power volume knob and button over here on the left. We also have a button to get easier access 
to the sound controls. That is kind of a handy touch in the era of Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And we use this button right here to turn the screen off at night. There's a single slot optical disc player below that. And then the controls for the dual zone automatic climate control system. Again, you can control the system either via these physical buttons or of course via the touch screen. This is where we find the heated steering wheel button right there and the controls for the heated and ventilated seats. Continuing back, we find the sync inputs right here under that roller cover, two USB inputs and a charging mat, and definitely enough room for the latest in large modern smartphones. The gear shift is a rotary design, so we rotate all the way clockwise like that to drive. If you want the manual mode, we hit this button right here, but we don't have any shift paddles on the back of the steering wheel, and that's what these large buttons right here behind the shifter do. So if we're in drive, this allows us to do drive six, drive five, drive four, whatever. Then if we hit the manual button, that light lights up and then we can command individual gears with these buttons right here. I didn't find this quite as handy as a more traditional shifter that allows you to toggle side to side or shift paddles. Behind that, we have our drive mode selector. This allows us to choose between the various modes like eco, sport, normal, tow haul mode, mud ruts, sand, grass, snow, etc. We then have controls for the four wheel drive system. We have two high, four auto, four low, and then a control for the locking rear differential. We have an autonomous parking system also in this vehicle. And then of course we have the active parking sensors which we can enable or disable via that button. Then to the right of everything, we find two large cup holders under that cover. Between the front seats, we have a large padded center armrest. And then behind that, we have two cup holders that the rear passengers can use. There are quite a number of cup holders in this vehicle total. If we open that up, we see a very large storage compartment where it's very easily able to fit a gallon of milk inside. You might actually even be able to fit two in there. We then also have a sliding divider right like that. You can see I have a wallet in there for size reference. And at the bottom, we find a 12 volt power port. These ridges are actually designed so you can put a standard American letter size hanging file folder in here and put all your documents if you wanted to. On the driver's side, we find essentially the same partial LCD cluster that we see in Ford's pickup truck line. There's a tachometer on the left, a speedometer on the right, and basically everything else that you see is on an eight inch LCD right between those two gauges. At the top of everything, we find a row of auxiliary gauges. And then if we put the vehicle into gear, you'll see that we have the transmission gear indication over here on the left, one through 10. You can use those up and down buttons to limit the gear choice. Or of course, we can engage the manual mode and then it will indicate the gear that we're in. The rest of the display gives us a wide variety of different information like power distribution front to rear, depending on what mode you're in, the ability to change certain vehicle settings. There's a towing page where you can see information on the various trailers that you've set up to use with the vehicle. We can also get some additional gauges in the system, for instance, a turbo boost gauge, tire pressure readouts, digital speedometer, engine hours, etc. There's also a section for our trip computer and fuel economy information. You can see we've been averaging about 15 miles per gallon. We also have a digital compass, auto start stop information. Then there's a favorite screen where you can more easily toggle through some of your top choices like trip fuel economy for one of those trip statuses, off-road status, etc. The steering wheel is a four spoke design with small sport grips up top and then this sort of split bottom spoke right down here. We find the controls for that multifunction LCD over here on the left side of the steering wheel. This allows you to toggle through those various screens as you can see right there. Then we have the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control. We set the distance with these buttons, speed with those buttons. On the right side of the steering wheel, we find the controls for the infotainment system, volume up, down, mode selection, track forward, backward. There's also a voice command button, a mute button, and then some dedicated phone buttons at the bottom. By the time the previous generation expedition was replaced, the basics of that vehicle were about 15 years old and it really started to show. Even though Ford had been tweaking things over time, for instance, they included their new 3.5 liter twin turbo V6 under the hood of that old model, well, the rest of the vehicle remained about the same. This twin turbo V6, on the other hand, produces more power than the outgoing V6 and it's mated to a new 10 speed automatic transmission. And that's why this goes zero to 60 faster. We clocked zero to 60 in this extended wheelbase model in 6.1 seconds. That is definitely quick. Now it is a little bit slower than the all new Tahoe RST at 5.8 seconds, but keep in mind that that Tahoe is actually shorter than the model that we're driving here. This is a little bit closer in terms of overall size to the Chevy Suburban. In our acceleration tests, this model was a hair faster than the Infiniti QX80 or the Nissan Armada, or of course the Lexus LX570, which I suppose you could call the Lexus competitor to this. However, if you want to go faster in your three row vehicle, there are definitely faster options. A Dodge Durango with the regular V8 engine will go from zero to 60 in 5.7. And if you get the Durango SRT, it will be significantly faster than this. 
In our braking tests, we stopped from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 126 feet, which is a surprisingly respectable distance because that's actually shorter than the last Durango that we tested, and the Durango is lighter than the model that we're driving. Keeping in mind that the scores that are up there at the top of your screen apply to other like vehicles, so other full-size SUVs like this, I'm going to give handling an A because the Expedition handles surprisingly well. Part of that's the independent rear suspension that we get in the rear, so this suspension is a lot less upset by bumps and cracks and rougher roads than the Tahoe or the Suburban. Although the General Motors full-size SUVs are very well tuned for a vehicle with a live rear axle, those suspensions can get upset, especially if you're pushing the vehicle harder on rough pavement. We don't find that to the same degree in the Expedition. Although this is still a big vehicle, so you do have to keep that in mind. This is obviously not going to handle as well as a Durango or as a Ford Explorer Sport, for instance, or many of those other three-row crossovers out there. You do have to give up that handling ability in order to have the full-size SUV. As you'd expect out of a full-size SUV, the ride quality out here on rougher gravel roads is excellent. The suspension does an excellent job at soaking up ruts and bumps, and of course the normal undulations in a gravel road like this. We've come to expect that from full-size SUVs, of course, because these have always been targeted at people shopping for something a little bit more rugged than the average minivan or three-row crossover. But over the last 20 years, the use case for these vehicles has seemingly narrowed a little bit. So you're more likely to find full-size SUVs like this out in the country where roads like this are perhaps a little bit more common than in the city. This is obviously a pretty big vehicle to try and park in a place like downtown San Francisco or in New York City. Back out here on a paved road, the ride is definitely very smooth and the cabin is surprisingly quiet. We scored 69 decibels in this cabin, which is luxury car quiet in this top end platinum trim. In fact, this is just about as quiet as the LX 570's cabin. Road noise appears to be a little bit higher in this cabin than in some of the luxury entries, so do keep that in mind. If you're driving on a particularly rough surface, then you may actually get slightly higher cabin noise figures in this vehicle uh, than in the Infiniti or in the Lexus. However, on average road surfaces, we clocked right around the same. Fuel economy is a little bit tricky to talk about, obviously because this is an enormous vehicle, but I'm going to give this a B. The reason for that is that even though we have lofty fuel economy estimates from the EPA, we were unable to achieve them. We've been averaging between 15 and 16 miles per gallon over a week of driving this vehicle, and that's two miles per gallon below what we should be getting according to the EPA. It's important to remember that a two mile per gallon difference down at this end of the fuel economy scale is a much bigger deal than going from say 32 to 30 miles per gallon in an average mid-size stand because you're going to be consuming a great deal more fuel in the Expedition. Now this is obviously more fun to drive than the average large three-row crossover so if you do floor your vehicle around an awful lot or if you're towing a trailer obviously expect fuel economy to be lower. However you will find better fuel economy in something smaller like again that Durango but it's not going to have the same towing ability as this vehicle and most importantly it's not going to feel the same well towing. The curb weight of this vehicle with me in it is nearly three tons and that means that if you're towing a 7,500 pound trailer, this vehicle is going to get pushed around by the trailer an awful lot less than the Durango, which does have a lighter curb weight. That's true for any vehicle out there, and that's why we don't really see the same attention to curb weight in heavy duty vehicles like full size SUVs like this or in large pickup trucks. Ford was able to pull weight out of the Expedition, but then they put it right back in here in terms of additional content and additional sound deadening. In addition to getting pushed around less than a three-row crossover would, we also have this 10-speed automatic transmission, which really is an asset to towing. The 10-speed auto does not have a significantly higher final ratio or a significantly lower starting ratio than the eight-speed automatics that we see in the competition. However, this does have more gears in between. That coupled with a very broad torque curve and an enormous amount of torque out of this engine mean that the Expedition always has the right gear ratio for you when you're towing a heavy trailer up the hill. I'm really pleased that Ford spent the time to really craft a brand new Expedition. Because as I said before, the reality of this segment shrinking means that a lot of companies out there have been phoning in their refreshes. They haven't been making significant changes and some manufacturers have just been selling the same vehicle with only minor tweaks for a really long time. And that included Ford last year with that 15 year old Expedition. But this is a very different kind of vehicle. It feels much more modern inside, outside, and on the road than any of the other full-size competition. 
The standard wheelbase expedition starts at 51,790. If you want the expedition max, which is what we were driving this week, that'll set you back at least 54,475. So you'll notice that the expedition is significantly more expensive than an Explorer or a Ford Flex, which are both fairly large three row vehicles already. When it comes to pricing, that difference really is the first thing you need to know about the Expedition. If you want the extra towing ability or the extra room that we find in the cabin, you really will have to be prepared to pay a great deal for it. You'll also have to be willing to pay more for the Expedition than the competitors. The Sequoia starts at $48,400, the Armada starts at $46,090, and the Tahoe splits the difference at $47,500. Now keep in mind that those three vehicles won't have as much power or a 10-speed automatic like we do find standard in the Expedition. When you look at the price tag, keep in mind that this is the newest vehicle overall in this particular segment. It also has, I think, the most premium interior and definitely the most modern interior. The way the Expedition rides and the way that it handles are absolutely excellent for full-size SUVs. Now, keep in mind that something like an Explorer Sport is going to outhandle an Expedition because it's lighter, it's smaller, etc. So when I'm talking about excellent handling, keep in mind that I am talking about it as compared to a Tahoe, an Armada, or a Sequoia. Third row room is also quite generous in the max trim especially. So if you're looking for a three row vehicle that has a bit more room in the back or a three row vehicle where you could put a dog kennel behind the third row and carry all of your family and your favorite furry ones, then this is going to be a better option than the average crossover because the average crossover has a fairly limited amount of room behind the third row. Now on the downside, the interior parts are still something of a mixed bag, especially in the platinum trim that we were driving this week. It started at $75,720 and ended up around $84,000, making it quite expensive for this segment and definitely in competition with something like a Cadillac Escalade. That brings us along to the main competitor for the Expedition, which would of course be found at General Motors. They have the Tahoe, the Suburban, the Yukon, the Yukon XL, and the Escalade. All of these vehicles logically compete with the Expedition, including that Escalade, which you could see as a competitor to the top-end Platinum version. Both the Ford and the General Motors series of SUVs are available in extended form or in standard form, and that is a key difference between them and something like the Toyota Sequoia or the Nissan Armada, because those are available only in one length. So if you want that extra room behind the third row, you will be limited to the Ford or the GM SUVs, or perhaps a trailer towed behind some of the other alternatives. Inside the cabin especially, it's obvious that the Ford is newer than the General Motors SUVs. We get more power out of the V6 engine than we get in GM's 5.3 liter V8, and more torque definitely than we find out of General Motors 6.2 liter V8, even at the top of their range. Interestingly enough, the top of General Motors SUV range is now using the exact same 10-speed automatic transmission that we find in the Ford, However, not all models of GM's full-size SUVs get that transmission. There is still kind of a blend of 6-speed, 8-speed, and 10-speed in the GM lineup. All the Ford Expeditions get the new 10-speed because Ford really seems to be focused on fuel economy. The main benefit to the Turbo V6, of course, is the massive amount of torque we get from that engine and the very broad torque curve. That coupled with the 10-speed automatic transmission and a chassis that was really designed for towing is why the Expedition beats the Tahoe by a decent amount when it comes to towing. And really none of GM's full-size SUVs come really that close to the tow ratings that we find in the Expedition. So if you really are looking to be able to lug around a 9,000 pound boat or some other vehicle behind you, the Expedition really is going to be the top pick in this group. Handling is also a point of differentiation between the two vehicles. The Expedition has Ford's very innovative rear suspension and that really does improve handling out on the road. Of course, obviously, as I said, this is still a big SUV, so don't expect this to handle like your average three-row crossover. One thing worth noting before we move on is that even in the Expedition Max, we don't find as much cargo room as we find in the back of a Chevy Suburban. So if you are looking to pack a little bit of cargo back there and perhaps a dog carrier for a large dog, you are going to find more room in the Suburban, but you will have to give up the more modern feature set and more modern interior that we find in the Ford. Next up, we have the Nissan Armada and the Toyota Sequoia. I've jammed these two vehicles together because they end up almost in the same category for me. Both vehicles seem a little bit behind the times, and it's really obvious when you stack them up against a new Expedition. Even though the current Armada was recently released in America in 2016, it feels old because it is old. The Armada is now the same thing as the international Nissan patrol vehicle that we've found in other countries for a while, and that vehicle dates back to 2010. Now, if you think that's old, hang on to your hats because the Toyota Sequoia dates back to 2008, and it really does show with both vehicles. Although, in general terms, the Armada feels just a little bit more youthful than the Toyota. The age shows mainly in the options and feature content that we find in the Nissan and the Toyota, and the way the gadgets work in those vehicles. 
but the age is also noticeable in the way that they drink gas because the Toyota is rated for 14 or 15 miles per gallon and you don't get an extended body Sequoia for those fuel economy ratings. That means that even the long wheelbase Expedition is significantly more efficient than the Toyota. Even though we get a relatively respectable amount of power out of the Toyota or the Nissan's V8 engines, both of them are notably less powerful than the V6 that we find in the Expedition as well. Some of that is due to the overall age of those engine designs, but some of it also has to do with the fact that the Toyota is still using their old 6-speed automatic, not the 8-speed automatic that Toyota uses in other vehicles. Nissan's Armada is slightly better than the Toyota, at 15 to 16 miles per gallon combined, thanks to a slightly newer engine and a 7-speed automatic, but both are well below the 19 to 20 miles per gallon you find in the Ford. It's also worth noting that neither of these vehicles offers a long body like we find in the Expedition Max, so neither vehicle is really a direct competitor to the one that we were driving this week. The Nissan and the Toyota are several thousand dollars less expensive than the Ford, and the Toyota has been quite reliable over time. However, you're likely going to pay that difference back in the fuel costs because the Expedition is quite a bit more efficient. Now let's move on to kind of a different oddball competitor, the 2018 Dodge Durango. This is not a body on frame vehicle. Instead of being a seven or eight passenger vehicle, it's also a six or seven passenger vehicle. So you get one person less on the inside. It obviously doesn't compete quite directly to the Expedition or especially the long wheelbase Expedition, but it does compete very well in general terms. The Durango is notably less expensive, so if you're looking for a discount option that has some of the room we find in the Expedition and a lot of the towing ability, the Durango could be a good option for you. Starting at $29,995 for the rear-wheel drive V6 model, $43,745 for the rear-wheel drive V8 model, it is considerably less expensive than the Expedition. Although tow ratings are obviously lower than the Expedition, they are still quite healthy. You could tow over 6,000 pounds with the V6 engine, 7,400 pounds with the 5.7 liter V8, and you can get up to 8,700 pounds of towing capacity if you were to choose the SRT version of the Durango. The 5.7 liter V8 and the 6.4 liter V8 both deliver excellent performance in the Durango when you compare them to the average entry in this segment. The 6.4 liter engine is especially quick for a three row vehicle. And even though that SRT will set you back about $63,000, that's just barely within the lower end of the price range for the Ford Expedition. So instead of buying a Ford Expedition with a few doodads and gizmos added to it, you could get the Dodge Durango SRT, tow 8,700 pounds, carry six people on the inside, and still be faster than the average BMW 3 Series you see at the stoplight races. Because of the smaller overall size and the lighter curb weight, the Dodge is also a little bit more efficient in real world driving, and it's definitely easier to park. But as I said before, at the end of the day, it's not quite the same thing. You could, however, look at it as a practical alternative to a full-size SUV rather than a direct full-size SUV competitor. My bottom line in this segment is if you're looking at a full-size SUV, the Ford Expedition is quite simply the best one available in the US. The rest of the competition really hasn't spent much money or time improving their models and keeping them current, even though Nissan recently brought that Armada to America. Overall reliability may be a little bit lower on the Ford versus something like the Toyota Sequoia. However, the average fuel economy really should wash a lot of that difference out. And of course, you'll end up with a more modern feeling, more luxurious and more comfortable SUV with the Ford as well. Now I would say if you're taking a look at the Platinum trim, which is actually the trim we were driving this week, I would skip the Platinum trim and instead I would get the Lincoln Navigator. Now I haven't talked about the Navigator too much because I'm actually driving it this week and we'll probably make the Explorer versus Navigator comparison in that video. So be sure and stay tuned for that one. Hit that subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen. Be sure and comment down there and let me know what you think about the Expedition and what you would buy if you're shopping in this particular segment. You can also find us over at patreon.com if you want to support this channel and I hope you do. You can click that little link up there at the top of your screen to move on over to that. And as always, find us over at facebook.com slash alexnauto so you can see what we're driving this week. I'll see you later.